Hey guys, um, thank you for joining me this week. I really appreciate all of you that are joining me. Um, some weeks it's smaller, some weeks it's bigger. I'm really appreciative of everyone. Um, before I get into this sermon called The Beautiful Ordinary Life, let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you're about to do and I, I thank you for what you're, um, what you're doing and I thank you for everyone out there, Lord Jesus. Speak to me, speak through me. Let your word come forth with power. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, hi guys. I, uh, this season, uh, this uh, holiday season, uh, this Christmas season is set is um, several things to many different people. For many people, it's the it's the most joyous uh, holiday of the year. They love decorating the tree. They love having family over. They love uh, for those of you in the U.S. They love Thanksgiving. They love Christmas. They love everything about this time of year, and they go all out. And for some people, though, it's a very uh, depressing time of year. Either they don't have any family near them, or or they don't have any family at all, or their family is estranged, or when their family uh, gets together, it's always a fight. So it's always like stress and like competition between siblings and this aunt doesn't get along with this uncle and it's all, all, it just seems to be stressful and um, it seems to just cause a lot of contention in a lot of families. Um, and like, it's so hard for those people because when they think of Christmas or the holiday season, they think of all the stress and contention. And we say that Jesus is the reason for the season, and he is, because we know he was born as a baby, and he, um, he came to us uh, through, um, through the Father, because he's the Son of God. But for a lot of people, the holiday season is just, they would say it's holiday hell. And I, I just want, and a lot of people go so elaborate with the holidays. They buy gifts for everybody and their brother. And they go really all out. And they just go all out. And it's all right to do that if you can, number one, afford it. Number two, if, if you know, if you give, if you give time and you give love to the people that you're giving to all year round. Um, but if you're just giving gifts, because you want to give gifts um, or you want to um, maybe um, prove something to somebody or you want to look good for somebody else. Um, the Lord is saying today, um, he's saying two things actually. He's saying check your motive for gift giving. Uh, and number two, he's saying, enjoy the beautiful, ordinary life. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. First, check your motives. Sometimes I know, even with me, that it may seem like I have pure motives, but when I, when I search within myself, when I look deeper at why I'm doing things, my motives are not pure of intention and it happens to us all um that sometimes we do things because a it's routine and b we want people to notice us 
When I started this seven years ago, I have to admit, um, although I started it with I thought was pure intentions, not that they weren't um, good intentions to get the gospel out there to people, to like to say that I had something to say, so let's just get the gospel out there, but. But some of my intentions were cloudy. They weren't, they weren't manipulative or anything like that. They've never been that. But, but I guess sometimes they were a bit, a bit cloudy, um, which I, which I mean, like not exactly. Um, they were for the gospel, but I was so worried about how many people were watching and whether people were getting something out of it, or whether I was hearing from God, I was so worried about all this, like, the, that the pu that the pureness of the moment it kind of got lost in some sermons. I remember putting sermons up where I would just check every day, is this person, is this person watching it, am I getting comments? Am I getting this? Am I getting that? Or are they, are are they liking it? Do they like me? Do they like this? And do they like that? Do they like what I'm wearing? Do they like I I would just go crazy. So what started off as pure intention became um, kind of murky intention, where I had to say, you know what? Stop. It doesn't matter if one person watches you. It doesn't matter if nobody watches you. What matters is that you were called to this. And what matters is that God told you to do this. He woke you up when you were 23 and told you to go on YouTube and spread the gospel using music and your own unique take on things. And he says, and I said, and that's what matters and that's my true intention. And even now I, fi I find myself like checking stats and whatever. And when I do, I most of the time have to say, wait, are, am I doing it for likes? Am I doing it because, you know, I want people to like recognize me or whatever and then I have to say no. I'm doing that because I was called here. I'm doing it because God assigned me to do this. And a lot of people, um, it starts off with the greatest intentions but it gets kind of murky. It gets kind of with cloudy intentions and like because I um for example a preacher could know that he is called and then when he starts up he's like we're gonna reach the world we're gonna do this but as the years go by the in not that the intention changes not that the Preacher becomes manipulative, nothing like that. But I'm s saying the pressure of oh performance can can sometimes cause the intention to get a little murky, and sometimes you don't even realize that it's happening until until you turn around that what until you turn around. Uh, and say, oh my gosh, uh, and you're, you're worried more, more about what people will think of your sermon rather than is what God is speaking to the people. And you're like, oh, I won't say that because people won't like me. But the Lord will say, they need to hear it. It doesn't matter if they like you. But you'll say, Lord, they won't like me anymore. And people's opinions come become more important than God's word. And it doesn't only happen 
to preachers, it happens to absolutely everyone in some way. Where you start off with um, pure intentions, but then it just it just spirals into what do they think of me? Are they thinking of me? Oh my gosh, how do I look? How do I do this? How do I do that? And and sometimes you need to just slow back, slow down. Sometimes I need to do this and I need to ask myself these questions like why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? And will it benefit them? So it's like why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? And how will it benefit them? Am I, wh why am I preaching? Because God called me and he gifted me to share his word in a unique way. Who am I doing this for? Number one, I'm doing it because for God. Number two, I'm doing it for people, but I am a vessel. I'm not the oil. I'm not uh, the thing being poured out, being examined. And um, are they benefiting from it? Now that question is hard for me to answer, but it's up to the people that are hearing the sermon to answer that question not myself and when and when you take so much of that weight on yourself and you're like oh what if they're not getting anything out of it what if that's that's a terrible thing to say what if that's an exalting thing to say what if they leave me in comments or whatever what if they don't get what i'm saying all that stuff eventually has to go and to say, God, um, a part of me doing this, a part of me preaching, all of me preaching is for you and you will reveal what they need to hear. See, my intention as a preacher may not be what you get out of it. Like, See, because I don't know everyone who will watch this sermon. And I don't know what everyone needs who will watch this sermon. So, I don't know how God will use my words. I can only be, I can only be faithful to what he's called me to, to do. And I can only be be obedient to what he's called me to say. And I've gotten to the point now where I can't worry about how they're responding to me or whether zero people watch this sermon or whether a hundred people watch this sermon. I just have to worry about being faithful and obedient to the call in what he's called me to. And that doesn't only go for preachers. That goes for every profession because I think that every person who is a believer is called by God. Wherever, wherever he's placed you, that is where you, you're called to be. If he's placed you as a mom, that's who you're called to be at the season of your life. If he's placed you as a stay-at-home dad, that's where he's called you to be at this stage of your life. If he's placed you in college or university, that's where he's placed you at this stage of your life. Don't rush the stages of your life. Be where he's called you and go all into where he's ca he called you. Don't be waiting for this almighty purpose. If you, like, take me for an example. Um, I don't have a church. I'm not an ordained minister, but I know I'm called to preach the gospel. So instead of 
fighting to try and get a job at my my church or other churches and trying to prove to people that I'm worthy. Instead of doing that, I'm using this platform of YouTube to preach the gospel the, the way I know how to do it. And eventually, when God sees fit, he will open the door or show me the direction he wants his ministry in me to take. See, I think we fight too much, and then when we fight too much, I think we get tired out too much. And when we get tired out, we get worn down, and the call, the call in which we've, we've been called has gotten lost. And also, uh, God's call could be lost in the pressure of people not only to perform but to do things in a certain way you know because when you're when you're when you're used to, when you're um when you do things in a certain way that is sometimes what people expect and the people around you may not know that God is changing you or you're not doing things a certain way and you might feel pressure from outside sources to always do things that way to do to to do to be to operate in that certain way and God is changing you and sometimes people don't understand especially if you're, let me go back to preachers for a second. Um, if you're a preacher and you're used to, and you lead a church or a congregation, and you are, and the congregation and the leadership is used to having you do things a certain way, and you're like, and you're like, okay, every year we do it this way, every year we do it this way and God is saying to shift, you might understand and be willing to go. You might understand and be willing to say, okay, God, whatever. But you might get pressure from your leaders to say, oh my gosh, we need to do it that way. We need to do it that way. And I'm just because uh, the Lord's been speaking to me about this, um, uh, and He's saying to me, He's saying, no matter what people say, you have to be willing uh, to die for what I've told you. If the Lord has given you a word out there, and He's sure giving you a word, do not let the pressure of people deter you from that word. I'm I'm not saying don't receive wise counsel. In the multitude of counselors there is safety. You need to receive wise counsel, but at the end of the day, God's word will stand forever. And if he's given you a word, you stick to that word. It's it doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter who wants to say what, let them say things. Even if you're a preacher and they're your leaders and they're giving you pressure, just pray for the strength to stick to God's guns. <laughs> He'll back you up. Because remember, it's his church and not yours. You're just the mouthpiece, the vessel that he's using. And in the end, he will get what he desires out of each and every ministry. And beyond ministry, I'm saying right now, if God has given you a word for your life, a word for your career, a word for your marriage, a word for your relationship, stick to that word as if your life depended on it. Hold on to that word with everything you've got. If you if you wake up 
every every day with something in your spirit and you can't let it go, don't let it go. Don't let it go because that word will come to pass. It doesn't matter how how it looks. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. But just know that word will come to pass. And this was not even my sermon today. But that word will come to pass. And um, now I'm going to talk about what I really came here to talk about. Um, oh, what was she? I want to speak to, before I get to that, I want to speak to everyone who has given up and let pressure just overtake them and, and, and cause them to just cave into what people want. It's not too late. It's not over. You can still correct. God is still faithful. His word will be accomplished. And all things are working together for, for, for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And all, also, all things are working together for the good of his glory. So even though you went off track and let pressure get to you, he's going to use whatever you did for his glory. Although it wasn't his original intention and you can correct yourself. It's not over. And now I'm going to get to the power of the or um, the power of um, the beautiful ordinary life. A lot of times, especially around this time of year, um, we, we focus so much on giving gifts and all that, as I said. And the Lord is saying today, um, focus on the beautiful ordinary life, which means focus on the beauty in your life um, and find value in the ordinary things. A lot of people say when I get there I'll be happy, when I get there I'll be happy, when I'm married I'll be happy, when I move out I'll be happy, when I do this I'll be happy and he's saying, the Lord said be content with where you are but still continue striving to achieve his purpose. So I had somebody say, I heard somebody say, a preacher say, are you to be content or do you strive for something greater? And I feel that you can do both. You could be content where you are, but you can still push for something greater. I don't think one can't candle out the other. So, for example, I'll use myself. Um, I'm content doing YouTube sermons. If if YouTube sermons is everything I will do for my entire life and everything that God has called me to do, that's fine. That's what he's called me to do. But at the same time, I know one day he's called me to start a church. So in my contentness, I can also strive for a greater point, part in ministry. And I can also put things together for, a, for my greater purpose in ministry as a pastor. So 
my being content on YouTube doesn't say that I can't want more, I can't desire more, that he won't give me the, the desires of my heart. My being content just says I won't rush from this space. I will learn and grow in everything you have for me in this space, but then I will still continue on into the more that you have for me. Being content doesn't mean you have to stay. Being content is like you're, you're okay with where you are but it's okay at the same time to want more. So it's okay to love your death job. Nothing wrong with that. While you're going to school at night and, and taking your business degree or doing something else. So contentment doesn't struck, doesn't negate that you strive for more. Contentment means wherever you are, whether you're in, in lack or in plenty, you are okay there. And you're okay with whatever God has for you. And God is, God is saying, Find beauty in your ordinary life. You don't have to look far to see beauty and it's, and it's the lens you look through. Um, I think um, a lot of people say uh, happiness is a choice and some people say it's not. Well, this doesn't make me happy. I think it is both. I think happiness can be a choice and is a choice. Um, and I think um, sometimes happiness, no, not happiness, joy is a choice and it can be a choice. And sometimes in all things, you don't feel joyful. You know, sometimes I think the reason why we don't feel joyful is because, see, we as humans, I think, are very myopic. We can only see through a glass dimly. And sometimes we just don't see how this could work together for our good. And don't be afraid to say to God, um, I know you said to be joyful in this, but I'm not feeling joy. Help me get there. And he will help you get there. Um, a situation happened to me this week where I was really angry at someone. And I was going to hit the roof. I said, well, this is what I'm going to happen and I'm going to do this. And this person is, I'm going to talk to them this, I'm going to do that, I didn't, I'm going to do this. And then throughout the days, my anger at the situation began to uh, alleviate because I didn't blow up. I didn't speak in anger to that person, although I wanted to, but I didn't speak in anger to that person. And I asked God, you know what, God, help me with the, these emotions. And he did, and I'm so glad he did. And he said, is this worth where you're going? It doesn't matter what other people think you should do. It doesn't matter what is right in their eyes or maybe right in society's eyes. But is this little blip on your radar really worth it? 
and he began to show me not only the consequences for myself, but the consequences for other people if I were to blow up and do what I wanted to with this person. And, and uh, at the end of the day, he resolved the issue. He's like, let me fight this battle. And the b battle he had to fight was the battle in me. Sometimes um, there's a song by Elevation Worship now called Never Lost a Battle. <laughs> but I was laughing the other day. I was like, most of my battles are not external. They're internal. So most of the battles that I'm fighting are battles in me. So, so, and still, he showed me through this thing. He showed me he's never lost a battle, even if it's in myself, even if it's in me warring for, for myself. He said, this thing is a distraction and just keep going. He said, keep going. You're not going to be at this place for much longer in your life. Just keep going. This is a minor distraction that the devil sent to distract you and tie you up. He said, everything that's going on in your life right now, Rachel, is a distraction and it's meant for the devil to tie you up. Don't let him do that. He, the overriding uh, message of my sermon today is look for beauty in the ordinary things. Look for beauty sitting with your family and enjoying dinner. Look for beauty uh, watching a movie with your son or daughter. Uh, look for beauty in the everyday things. Enjoy your everyday life. Enjoy going for walks. Enjoy going to work. Change your perspective on your job. Change your perspective at your school. It just takes a change of perspective. And I think when you begin to change your perspective, you begin to have a much lighter and more joyful attitude towards your life. I think a lot of people's perspectives are wrong. Uh, I heard a pastor say this one time. He said, your perspective is your reality. And I, and I believe that wh whatever you perceive is real to you. And whatever your emotions are, are real to you. But what I had to do in my own life was change my perspective and ask the Lord to help me have the proper emotional response uh, to this. Help me have the proper spiritual response to this. Help me have the proper physical response to this. Because He knows what responses will work best in your situation. So ask Him to help you. I did this week and it really helped me. It really resolved the issue. I'm not angry or bitter or upset anymore. And that's all because I had to change my perspective and realize that this may be a big thing now, but it's a blip on my radar. So guys, thank you so much. Um, this will be my last sermon for, in, for the Christmas break. I will be back January 4th, 2020. Um, have a wonderful holiday season. 
And I'll see you in the new year. Bye. Remember to enjoy the beautiful ordinary life. Nothing ordinary about the way I feel Nothing not extraordinary, this is real No need to reach for the stars I'll be here on earth in my beautiful ordinary life I love my beautiful ordinary life with you Nothing ordinary about the way I feel Nothing not extraordinary, this is real No need to reach for the stars I'll be here on earth in my beautiful ordinary life I live my beautiful ordinary life With you Don't save it all for Christmas Day. Find a way to give a little love every day. Don't save it all for Christmas Day. Find a way, cause when holidays have come and gone, Love lives on if you give on love. Merry Christmas and have a happy new year and a blessed holiday season. See ya on January 4th.